Hello everyone and welcome to the final episode in this mini-series about the basics of implementing skeletal animation with OpenGL and this week I'm going to be talking a bit about loading up information about animations and animated models from files. So in this episode I'm first going to talk about exactly what data we need to extract from the files, we'll then have a look at the Collada file format as an example, and then finally I'll talk quickly about the main points of interest in my specific implementation of a simple Collada parser. So there are two main things that we want to be able to load up from files in our animation system. One is animated models and the other is animations. This will of course allow us to create rigged models and animate them easily in 3D modeling software like Blender and then we can export the model and the animations to some sort of file which will then be able to load up into our application. To load up the animated model we're going to need to extract data for both the mesh or the skin and the skeleton, the hierarchy of joints. The skin data is just everything that we're going to store in the VAO, so all the data about the vertices. That's going to include the vertex positions, texture coordinates, normals and indices if you're using them, which should all be pretty simple to extract from whatever file format you're using. And then there's also the skinning information, the joint IDs and the corresponding weights. When you're extracting the skinning information you need to be aware of a couple of extra things. Firstly, in our animation system each vertex can only have a maximum of three joints affecting it, so three joint IDs and weights, although that could be increased to four if you wanted. However, depending on what file format you're using, the model file may not have a limit for the number of weights per vertex, and so some vertices may be affected by four, five, six, or even more joints, and these will all be stored in the file. So when you're loading up the skinning data for each vertex, you'll need to only take the three most influential weights and the three joint IDs that they correspond to and I'll show you later how I implemented this. The second thing that you need to be careful with when loading the skinning information is that all of the weights for any given vertex must add up to one. It's quite likely that this will already be the case in the model file, but seeing as we're going to be only taking the three most influential weights for each vertex, the weights that we take won't add up to one if there were originally more than three joints affecting that vertex. So make sure to normalize the weight values so that they add up to one again. So that's all the data that we need to load for the skin, which of course then gets stored in the VAO. So let's now take a look at what data we need for the skeleton of our animated model. The skeleton is made up of a hierarchy of joints, and each joint needs three bits of data. The joint index, the joint's name, and the original bind transform of the joint, either in bone space, so relative to the parent joint, or if the file format that you're using provides it, the inverse model space transform because the only thing that we're going to use this bone space transform for is to calculate that inverse bind transform, which is really what we actually want. The joint index here is the position in the joint transform array where this joint's transform will be stored, and it has to correspond with the joint IDs that are stored in the mesh VAO, so you can't just come up with your own order for the joints, you have to use the indexes that the file is using for the joints because it will be using those same indexes for the skinning information, and obviously you need them to match. The joint's name or ID is just used to identify the joint, and it's used in the animation data structure to indicate which transform applies to which joint. If I'd done things slightly differently, I think we could probably actually do without the name and just identify the joint using the index, but either way, it's easy enough to load up from the model file if you need it. So that's all the information that we need for each joint, but we also need to know how exactly the hierarchy of joints is arranged, which joint is the root joint, which joints are children of which other joints, and so on. And once we've loaded up the hierarchy of joints and the information about each joint, we'll have everything that we need to know about the skeleton. So that's the animated model done, so let's now have a look at what data we need to load up for an animation. This is actually quite a bit simpler than the animated model, because all we really need to load up is the information about all the keyframes, and for each keyframe we just need to load up the time of the keyframe, and the local bone space transform of the joints, which ideally would be stored in the file as a position and rotation, because that's the format we need them to be in for interpolating, but they may be in a different format, like in Collada files where they're stored as matrices. So when you're loading up the joint transforms for the animations, you may need to convert them to this format. Now that we know exactly which data we need to be able to extract from a file, I'm going to show you a specific example of where we can find all this data in the file formats that I'm using, which is the Collada file format. Collada files are structured in an XML format, and I would imagine that most of you are probably already familiar with XML, 
But if you're not, I'll put a link to a tutorial in the description, um, but it's very simple. I'm sure you won't have any trouble with that. As you can see, a Collada file is split into multiple sections, and half of these sections we don't really care about, like cameras, images, effects, and materials. But the sections that we do care about are geometries, which contains the basic mesh information, animations, which contains all the data about the animation keyframes, controllers, which has all the skinning information and also some information about the joints, and finally, visual scenes, which contains information about the joint hierarchy. So let's start off by having a look at where all the information for the mesh is stored. And as I just mentioned, the basic mesh data is found in the geometry section. This section contains all the information you would expect to find in an OBJ file. So from here, we can extract the vertex positions, texture coordinates, normals, and indices. This here is a list of all the vertex positions. So this is one position, this is another, and it also gives you the number of floats that are in this list here. And the access a child node gives you a bit more information about this data if you need it. So it shows that each position has three floats. There are 740 positions altogether, which is obviously this number divided by this number. And it also tells you that the three values are X, Y, and Z, which you hopefully already knew. And it's exactly the same for the list of normals here and the texture coordinates. So just like how we loaded up an OBJ file back in episode 10 of my tutorial series, the first thing that you would do would be to read in these three lists. Then down here in the polylist section, we have all the information about how these vertices are arranged into triangles. And this is exactly like the faces lines in an OBJ file, but just all put together into one long line. So this tells us that the first vertex uses position 97, so that's the 97th position in the list of positions. It uses normal vector 0, which would be this one, texture coordinate 0, and also color 0, although we don't really care about the color. Then you do the same for the next two vertices, and then those first three vertices make up the first triangle in the mesh. And it is of course the same for all the rest of the data. This v-count list above just tells us how many vertices are in each polygon, which is why they're all three, because we're just using triangles. And the input nodes here tell us what each of these indexes refers to, and you can see the order from the offsets here. So that's how I knew it was position, normal, texture coordinate, and then color. The source attribute also tells you exactly which set of data is which, in case you weren't already sure. So for example, the normals are stored in the cube mesh normal source which as you can see is this one here as we expected. So that's the basic mesh data, but we still need to find the skinning information, the joint IDs and the weights for each vertex. This information can be found in the library controllers section and we're just going to ignore this stuff at the top for now, we'll be coming back to it later. But for now, we just care about the weights information, which is down here. Firstly, we have a list of all the weights that are used and these aren't all just ones, there are some more numbers further on but they are all less than one for hopefully obvious reasons. So the first step here would be to read in all of these weights into an array of floats so that you can easily access them. Then in the vertex weight section, we have all of the important stuff. Firstly, the count value here should just be the number of vertices in the model. Then the input information here tells us that this data is in the format joint, then weight. The V count data tells us how many joints affect each vertex and there should of course be 740 values in this list, one for each vertex. So this tells us that the first vertex is affected by two joints, and the information about these joints is in the V data. So the first vertex is affected by joint 3 with the corresponding weight 54, and you can get the actual weight value from that array of weights that we saw earlier. And the first vertex is also affected by joint 6, with weight value 103, and again we have to get the actual weight value from the array of weights. As another example, the second vertex is affected by three joints, so that's joint 3 with weight 45, joint 4 with weight 243, and joint 12 with weight 59. And again, those are not the actual weight values, those are the indexes that we have to use to get the actual weight value from the array of weights. So one final example, the third vertex has one joint affecting it, and that is joint 5 with weight 4, and presumably weight 4 will have a value of 1, seeing as there's only one joint affecting that vertex. 
So that is all the skinning information done and we're now going to move on to the skeleton. Staying in the controller section for now, we also have some information about the joints up here. Firstly, we have a list of all the joints in the body in order, which is important because this tells us the index of each joint. So the torso joint is index 0, chest is index 1, neck 2, head 3, and so on. And we know that this is a list of the joints because in the joint section here, it tells us that the joints can be found in the source armature cube skin joints, which is this one here. Also, and I didn't actually realize this before, we can find the inverse bind transforms for all the joints in the armature cube skin binds poses, which is here. So we could actually load the inverse bind transforms directly from the file instead of calculating them in the code, but at least you now know how to calculate them if you ever need to. These transforms are of course 4x4 four four matrices and they're stored here row by row. So for the inverse bind matrix for the torso joint, this is the first row, this is the second row, this is the third row, and this is the fourth row. Then for the next joint, the chest, this here is the first row, this is the second row, and so on. And you'll notice that there are 256 floats here because each matrix is 16 floats and there's one matrix for each of the 16 joints. To find out about the hierarchy of the joints, we have to go into the visual scene section where we can find the armature and the root joint, the torso. And we know that it's a joint because of the type and the ID here gives us the name of this joint. And of course we can get the index of this joint by finding its position in that list of joints that we just saw in the controllers section. If I open up this joint node, you can see that it has three children joints, the chest, the upper left leg, and the upper right leg. It also has the original bone space transform of this joint that we can of course use to calculate the inverse bind transform if we want to. If I now open up one of these children joints, so let's go for the upper left leg, I find the bone space bind transform for that joint, and any children nodes of that joint, which is of course just the lower left leg. And hopefully you can guess what we'll find when I open up this node. We find the transform for that joint, and it's one child joint, the left foot. So all of this gives us the information about the skeleton hierarchy. All we have left to find now is the animation data, and that of course is in the animation section. This contains the animation data for each of the joints in the body, and if we open up one of these, this comprises of two things that we care about, the input and the output. The input is a list of times for each of the keyframes for this joint, and the output is a list of the bone space transforms of this joint at each of those keyframes. So this here is a list of five matrix transforms, again stored row by row. So for example, at time zero, this joint will have this local transform. Finally, the target attribute in the channel node down here tells us the name of the joints that these keyframes refer to. When I was animating the joints in Blender, I made sure that they all had keyframes at the same time to make things simpler, but as I mentioned in the previous video, you could easily have keyframes at different times for each of the joints by shuffling things around a bit in the code. So you should now hopefully know where to find all of the necessary information in a Collada file, and if you want to learn more about the Collada file formats, I've put a link in the description to a tutorial that I found extremely useful when I was learning about it myself. To finish off this week, I'm just going to very quickly talk about a few things in the code which might not be immediately obvious. Most of it's just simple reading in data from the file, but there are three or four slightly more complicated parts. So firstly, as I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure to limit the number of weights per vertex to three in our case, and I do that in the vertex skin data class. And to do this, I order the weights by size when they get added, and then I only select the top three. The weights then have to be normalized to make sure that they add up to one, and this is done by taking the total of the three weights and dividing each weight by that total. Another thing to note is that the coordinate system in Blender is different to the coordinate system that we're using. So in Blender, the z-axis is up, whereas I have the y-axis as up. If you don't fix this, your man will look like he's lying down like this. So I had to apply a minus 90 degrees rotation around the x-axis to the entire model when loading it, which I did by applying it to the root joint. And I also did the same thing when loading the animations so that the animation transforms are also correct. 
Next up, the joint transforms in the animation keyframe data is provided in the collage files as matrices, and I couldn't find an export setting that would change that, so we need to convert the transforms from matrix format to position and quaternion rotation when we load them. The position can simply be found in the final column of the matrix, while the rotation is found in the top left 3x3 section, and I have a method in the quaternion class which can extract the quaternion rotation from that part of the matrix. And if you want to learn more about how that conversion works, there's a link in the comment for that method. Also, one thing in the Collada file that I didn't mention is this here, which I believe is the bind transform of the model's origin in relation to the Blender scene origin. In my very simple Collada parser, I actually just ignored this, and I just made sure that in Blender that the model's origin and the scene's origin were the same by applying the location, rotation, and scale to the model. And I also had to do the same thing for the armature object as well. And one final note, the code that I've been providing in this series is just meant to be a really simple working demonstration of the concepts that I've covered in this series, just for you to look at and to learn from, and it's definitely not meant to be an animation library that you would use in any serious project. I simply created it for the purpose of these tutorials. So that is going to be it for this animation mini-series, for now at least. Perhaps I'll come back to it in the future when I've learnt some more about more complex animation topics, but for now, I've told you pretty much everything I know. So I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you were able to learn something from it, and of course if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, and I'll try my best to help you if I know the answer. Do let me know what you'd like to see me do tutorials on next, preferably OpenGL or graphics related stuff, and even better if it's stuff that you know I've done before because you've seen it in my devlogs, but I am also open to learning about new topics that I could then cover in the tutorials. For this week though, that is it. Thank you guys very much for watching this series, I hope it was worth the wait. Do subscribe if you haven't already, have a wonderful week, and I will see you all next time.